Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Linda Zippo, President and CEO of the Center for Nonprofits, and I'm glad to welcome you to today's webinar, Going Forward, Best Practices and Considerations for Nonprofit Reopening. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Nonprofits is New Jersey's state association for the nonprofit community. Since 1982, the center has existed to strengthen New Jersey's nonprofits individually and collectively to improve the quality of life for the people of our state. Our programs include advocacy, education, professional training, expert information and referral, cost-saving membership programs, and much more. The center is a member of the National Council of Nonprofits, the state's, the nation's largest nonprofit network, over 25,000 organizations strong. The Council of Nonprofits serves as an advocate, central coordinator, and mobilizer to help nonprofits achieve greater collective impact in local communities across the country. If your organization is a member of the Center for Nonprofits, uh, you're also a member of the National Council of Nonprofits, but we thank you for your support and involvement as we pursue this work together. If you're not a Center for Nonprofits member, we hope you'll consider joining. Membership offers access to a wide array of benefits, and it helps to amplify the collective work of our state's nonprofits. And if you join by June 30th and use the discount code ADVOCATE, you'll get 10% off your dues for the coming year. So feel free to visit our website or contact us to find out more. One of our signature programs is our annual statewide nonprofit conference, the largest annual nonprofit conference uh, in the state, which combines forward thinking insights, great connections, practical tools and takeaways and much more. Like so many nonprofits, we've had to rethink our conference due to COVID-19 for this year, but we're excited to announce that we will be holding our 2020 conference virtually during portions of December 2nd and 3rd. So save the dates and stay tuned for more information because we are going to be putting together a program that I'm sure you will find valuable. Today, we'll be focusing on a variety of facets related to moving forward in today's environment. We'll focus on readiness essentials for your workspace, human resource considerations, communicating with stakeholders, gatherings and events, and more. I'm going to be your MC today and I'll be bookending today's session and in just a little while I'll be turning things over to our presenters. Joining us from our small but mighty center team are Debbie Duncan, our Director of Member Services, Susan Merrill O'Connor, Director of Communications, and Caitlin Giles McCormick, our Program Coordinator. We are also thrilled that Maxine Newhauser of Epstein Becker Green will be sharing her insights regarding employment issues in the current climate. Mickey, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. By way of a reminder, this is not a legal or a professional health presentation. If you need legal health advice or health assistance or counseling, please uh, contact a qualified professional. We do have a lot to cover today and we will be going through the information fairly quickly, but today's session is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording along with the slides and other follow-up information via email. There's also in your control panel a drop-down for handouts and we've provided three handouts today that you can download at your convenience. If you have any questions or technical difficulties, please enter your question into the chat box. Also feel free to ask any substantive questions at any time. We do have a couple of periods set aside for Q&A during the webinar, but if there's a question we can't address during the presentation, we will do our best to follow up afterward. As you know, the COVID-19 situation has uh, been a monumental shift and things are changing rapidly. So during the presentation and in the follow-up materials, we'll share some links and other resources so that you, you can be kept informed. But above all, if you're not already connected to the state's coronavirus information hub, be sure you check it often at covid19.nj.gov. The Center for Nonprofits also maintains a comprehensive COVID-19 information page that's tailored to nonprofits and updated regularly. So please bookmark that site and visit it often. I seem to have missed something here. Um, as before we dive in, I just want to make a, a mention that as horrific as 
the situation has been with respect to COVID-19 and how de as devastating as the pandemic has been. This is not just a public health crisis, it's a racial and a social justice crisis. With the impact of COVID-19 falling disproportionately on communities of color, it's just one symptom of the systematic and systemic racism that infects our country. As nonprofits, we exist to make society better and we have a responsibility to work actively internally and externally to fight racism and advance a more just society. Uh, the Center is committed to redoubling our efforts to advance equity and justice alongside Champions for Change, and we welcome the opportunity to learn from and work with. So where we are right now, um, as you know, the governor declared a state of emergency back on March 9th, it seems quite like quite a long time ago. Um, the governor issued his first stay-at-home stay order on March 21st. And we've been slowly working our way back ever since. Um, as you know, the stay at home order was lifted yesterday, but a number of restrictions remain in place. These two screenshots are actually uh, thumbnails of handouts that are in the, the handout uh, section of, of and downloadable today. Uh, but these are the guiding principles that the state has been using in terms of working our way back. So there are six principles that focus on um, reducing caseloads, expanding testing, contract contact tracing, and the like. Um, and then on the right side, there are uh, phased recoveries with respect to stage one, two, three, and stage four is uh, back to essentially the new normal. These items are, for the latest information on this stuff, there is a very long hyperlink at the bottom of this slide, um, and you can copy it and paste it in your, in your uh, browser for the very latest information. This stuff is changing daily, so um, you know it is important for you to keep up on it that way. Um, so in terms of where we are right now, um, the governor announced, of course, that we are uh, Nearing the end of stage one, stage two is going to be launching relatively soon, and then stage three is more to be announced. So you've seen a lot of the announcements about specific industries, when they can restart with restrictions and the like. Um, so that's important to keep up with, with those phases in, in terms of different ty types of activities. But it's also important to keep in mind that throughout these phases, until a vaccine and treatment uh, reliable treatment are found, certain restrictions stay in place. The governor says work that can be done from home should be done from home. Uh, High-risk individuals should stay at home. And of course, very important hygiene and social distancing guidelines uh, must continue to be followed. So we'll be talking about those things uh, repeatedly throughout the, uh, throughout the session, but it's important to keep that in mind. Um, just by way of some rough timelines here, again, the detailed information is on uh, the web through the COVID-19 state page, but the stage one has uh, been phased in from the beginning of May through the beginning of June, and that's where a lot of the outdoor recreational activities were started to be reopened and some of the non, uh, some of the elective surgeries were starting to be resumed. Stage two begins on uh, 15th, which is Monday, I believe, and that includes child care centers for non-essential uh, for non-essential workers, outdoor dining, other kinds of non-essential re retail from an indoor perspective, uh, some motor vehicle uh, offices, some other uh, day camps and, and things like that. Again, much more information available on the web, but you can see how these things are being phased in. Stage three, which we haven't gotten to yet, will include expanded di dining, critical in-office work, some more entertainment, more personal care, and things like that. But again, just to reiterate that across all of these stages, the state is encouraging people who can work from home to continue to do that. Um, and again, with special protections for high-risk individuals and making sure that social distancing and uh, health precautions are maintained. So the Center for Nonprofits create, we adapted the Going Forward Guide as a blueprint to help assist nonprofits as you're going through this journey. We recognize, of course, that many, many organizations and many, many workers have not closed in any stretch. You might have adapted how we work. Uh, many organizations have 
uh, staff that are not able to work remotely. And so we recognize that this is a reality that's going to vary with respect to many organizations. But there are a lot of questions with respect to how to move forward in this environment. So we're very grateful to the Oklahoma Center for Nonprofits from whom we adapted our going forward guide here in New Jersey. Um, we are both part of the National Council of Nonprofits Network, which has a very strong culture of sharing. And of course, we're grateful to the many agencies, government offices, others that may, have made resources available uh, that we've been able to draw from. If you haven't seen the reopening guide, uh, you will, of course, and you'll see that in the appendix, there are a lot of links to, to different resources to cover different kinds of scenarios. Um, some guiding principles, again, as we work to reopen, um, some leading with your values, follow the government public health directives, lead with your mission, um, prioritize safety, um, communicate, transparency is absolutely key, and you'll hear a lot about that. And again, as I mentioned before, um, racial uh, and social justice, equity, cultural competency have to be the word the watchword. This, this is not a tangential kind of activity. This has to be very deliberate, intentional, and integrated into everything that you do. Now, I am very happy to turn things over to Debbie Duncan, our Director of Member Services, uh, who has been with the Center for 15, more than 15 years. We uh, is a, such an invaluable member of our team. Debbie is going to walk us through the issues of workplace readiness from a facilities kind of standpoint. Debbie? Thank you, Linda. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me clearly. Uh, we're going to look at the operations and uh, workplace readiness before returning to the office. We need to, once the decision is made to return to the physical space, you need to get ready. Um, advanced preparation is critical. Start as early as possible, but do invest the time to address the issues and challenges ahead of time to facilitate as smooth a transition as possible. Every workplace will have different needs, resources and priorities. And some organizations, as Linda said, may never have fully closed, closed and are just expanding, but others may be starting up again from scratch. You wanna prepare for re-engagement with considering your office, your staff and your clientele. Work with and inform your board, uh, keep them apprised. You wanna include thorough risk management and scenario planning considerations. You may want to consult some specialists like your attorney or your insurance agent, uh, HR and financial researchers, such as the Society for Human Resource Management, uh, the Nonprofit Finance Band and others. And again, the center has resources to um, help you uh, find uh, those connections if you need them. Communicate with transparency. Inform your constituents and donors uh, and the public uh, in advance of what your plans are and what your schedule is. For guidance on health and legal requirements, uh, you're going to look at, to the World Health Organization, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the state of New Jersey, and finally your local county health departments. These are your primary sources for guidance on uh, COVID concerns. There is, uh, in the guidebook that accompanies this uh, webinar, there's a comprehensive document from the CDC. And also check the center's COVID-19 research page, which is constantly being updated. You're going to start off by establishing a task force with a leader to, to establish the reentry process and policies. Uh, this is really important. Policies and procedures, you're going to be looking at both in the workplace and out of office functions. For small nonprofits, this may be the job of an executive director and board committee, uh, a few people. A larger organization may include their human resources manager, finance director, IT technician, and other senior staff members. When you finalize clear and uh, policies and procedures in advance, you're going to communicate them to your staff and volunteers before they return to the office. And then you're going to set up monitoring practices for safety, cleanliness, uh, maintaining distance, etc. So let's talk about preparing the actual workplace, the space itself, uh, for return. You need to assess the space for social distancing. Can you have desks six feet apart? Are there cubicles, uh, offices? 
uh, gathering areas? What are we going to do about waiting rooms and conference rooms? Uh, can you can you work that out to meet your needs? Uh, what about uh, kitchen areas uh, and eating areas and bathrooms? How do people come in and out of those and how many people can be handled? Uh, finally, think about how many employees are going to be returning when you're doing this and then estimate how many visitors or clients will be coming in and at what rate and check your state and uh, federal directives to make sure you're in compliance. Before people return, you're going to want to thoroughly clean and sanitize the workplace and common areas. You're going to make sure that there are cleaning and sanitizing supplies in public locations uh, in, the, in, the, in your site. You want to stock up some face masks for people who don't have them and have all the sanitizing products and cleaning supplies, uh, PPE that you, you, you're going to need, uh, extras. And of course, follow guidelines for sanitation and social distance that your local health department and others provide. Non-surgical masks or cloth coverings should be sufficient for most people, uh, but it depends on your situation. One thing people don't think about too much is the air handling or HVAC system. Is it in compliance with standards under these circumstances? Check with your landlord or facilities person. And if they are not sure, you can direct them to the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers. I can't believe I said that. <laughs> okay. Um, they, here are some things you need to consider uh, as you, you know, go through this process. Uh, organizational and individual needs and capacities should be considered. Uh, do, do volunteers and staff have technology for communication? Uh, you may want to have flexible work sites, some teleworking. Uh, you may want to adapt meeting rooms for workspaces. You may want to consider flexible work hours, staggering shifts. Uh, is there plant transportation available for uh, some of your employees who might want or need to come in? You want to increase the physical space between employees and you want to increase the physical space between employees and the clients. Postpone non-essential meetings and events and make them virtual. Uh, you may want to have plastic shields at the reception desk, etc. What protection will be needed for the types of interactions that your organization does uh, engage in? Some other things are do you need to downsize operations? You need to kind of take a step back and say, you know what, we can't come back fully. Uh, we're going to have to still, we're going to have to limit this, you know, th these functions. Can you deliver services remotely? Can you deliver programs through virtual and or digital platforms? Can supplies be shipped someplace uh, that they, where they need to be? Um, what, uh, what communication capacities are lacking uh, or keep, prevent you from doing this? And finally, rely less on paper that's passed around the audience. Remember, paper can carry the virus. So as you start bringing the staff back into the physical workplace, you want to have, you want to bring the staff together. You want to have the written policies and procedures available and have a virtual or small group meeting and review the policies. When you do this, be sure to allow for questions and concerns. Invite suggestions for improvement and concerns and have at least two or three communication channels for conveying them. Okay, it might be oral, it might be by email, it might be by suggestion box, it may be that you, you identify an ombudsperson. There are many ways to do that. But you want to give staff and volunteers a stake in the process. You want them to know that you are all partners in maintaining a safe and respectful work environment, cultivating that team investment in healthy practices and in sharing the workload to make it happen. Allow time for restarting equipment and cleaning. Technology is important here. Um, there are some articles in the appendix of the, doc, of the uh, guidebook uh, to refer to. Larger organizations, you may want to check with your IT department and see what can be done in advance. Smaller organizations, maybe have one person, designated person, come in ahead of time and do some updating. You're going to need to dust and clean the equipment before you turn it on so that fans aren't bringing the dust into the, into the equipment. Uh, you're going to need time to run updates on your operating systems and programs. 
uh, this may take, this could take hours, literally. Email may be backlogged. Be patient letting your system um, catch up and be prepared to have batteries on hand <laughs> because you never know what's been sitting for three months and no longer works. Finally, <clears throat> instruct the staff on transferring digital data safely. Okay, don't just email your files. Okay, virus check something at home, put it on a USB key, bring it into work and virus check it before it goes on the computer. Uh, these things are very, very important and will save you headaches and uh, a lot of problems. We're talking about a, a commitment from the staff to stick to these guidelines. So all staff, board members, and frequent visitors in Clarentel, we recommend sign a statement of commitment. We call it an oath of personal responsibility. While it's not legally binding, it affirms our responsibilities inside and outside of the office to maintain social distancing, good hygiene, disease detection, and management. In the guidebook, there is a sample oath of responsibility, uh, which I have listed here, but you can read it in the guidebook and obviously adapt that to meet the needs of your organization. You are gonna to want to implement a clean desk policy with the staff responsible for their own workspaces. That's gonna include daily cleaning, of high touch areas, keyboards, mouse, handles, phone, clean up after eating, empty the trash every and, and recycling every day. And again, minimize uh, paper usage. We also, of course, what's on the top of the list? We also have to wash our hands, okay? Sing that alphabet song. Um, hand sanitizer and disinfecting wipes available uh, in common areas. Do not resist the temptation to use your coworkers, desk and equipment. I'm just gonna borrow this, you know? Um, and finally, use EPA registered household disinfectants and follow the directions. If it says five minutes it takes to disinfect, leave it on for five minutes before wiping it off. That's really, really important. We need to routinely clean and disinfect all frequently touched areas, but especially think about the common use and gathering areas any shared workstations you have, common use equipment, copiers, projectors, remote controls, handrails, doorknobs, don't forget light switches, the coffee pot handle, <laughs> the refrigerator handle. All of these things are, are common usage and uh, when 50 pans have touched them during the day, you know that there's a good chance of contamination. You also want to, you do not want to become complacent. Okay, you want to make sure that you are continue to monitor this. And one thing you can do is empower your staff to take responsibility. Rotate monitoring, determine who has the most interest or the right skills to handle each responsibility, and get feedback from your staff regularly, maybe once a week. What's working? What isn't? What can we change to make this more effective and less uh, onerous? So now you're going to instruct your staff on the procedures and the supplies, okay? Where, where are where supplies are located? Okay, same old thing. Don't shake hands, don't hug. We're all used to that. Uh, wear the masks in common areas when you go out for uh, to meet somebody, when you're transporting supplies from one end of the office to the other, uh, use, your, use your masks. Again, hand washing and physical distancing uh, may require signs and markings to help people get, make a, get a sense. These are old habits that we, we have these old habits that are in need to be adjusted and it takes time and it takes a perseverance. I'm gonna say a few things about food handling. You have the internal food handling. Um, you want to, may wanna limit, uh, and these are all options for you to consider or have no communal food such as shared food or buffets, even coffee, think about it have employees eat alone perhaps to preserve social distancing depending on the space that you have available. Restrict communal food uh, in refrigerators and cupboards should people empty it every, every day or certainly uh, not have it in for very long and do we want to have things that people are, are sharing. We also want to think about any kind of food service. If you prepare food and especially and, and serve clientele, it is cannot be self-serve. It must be served by staff with appropriate personal protective equipment. And of course, 
always follow the local health department and the FDA guidelines when handling food. Protocols for public opening and closure. I wanna thank our neighbors, the Progressive Center for Independent Living. Uh, they're getting their office set up to, to open fully. And they have, uh, as you can see on the left, they have a sign on their door as you come in saying, please wear your face mask. They're installing uh, plexiglass uh, barriers at the reception desk to protect both the receptionist and uh, their, the people coming in. You're gonna need to have clear communication to staff and the public. It's absolutely essential. Uh, employees returning to the job does not necessarily mean they're open to the public. Make sure you communicate that in advance. Employees will need specific guidelines. Who is allowed to enter the office and when? If you open for visitors, post signage about safe practices expected and have them in the appropriate languages. Do not assume that everyone knows what to do. Very important. You may want to consider having outdoor or curbside transactions as appropriate. Um, you may have quick drop-offs or quick consultations. All visitors should sign in. This is critical because then it allows for contact tracing. Should remember that regular visitors read and sign that oath of personal responsibility. And do not make arbitrary exceptions, okay? If a board member comes in, well, I'm just going to run in and do this, or I'm just dropping something off, whatever. You need to be very clear about that. It's not just this one person. It's everybody that they come in contact with. And finally, make sure you've notified your mail and delivery services that the office is open. <laughs> uh, don't, don't forget to do that. I want to again, share some photos from the Progressive Center for Independent Living with you. Um, in the center, you can see their welcome visitor sign, which basically says, if you're sick, don't come in. Um, we have, they have a um, uh, instructions on, um, you know, uh, you know, have, if you feel sick, you know, what are the policies you need to, you need to, to uh, follow in their office space. And then they also have a uh, signage uh, on the left is a uh, sign, the uh, one-way sign on the hallway. The next next slide, Linda. Uh, on the left is the sign, one-way sign for the hallway. They actually installed a touchless faucet so that people don't have to be touching the handles uh, to use uh, to wash their hands. And again, you can see um, approaching the reception desk, there are uh, markings for the six-foot distance. So this, these are some of the things that uh, you might, you can consider. Uh, they're offered as guidelines. As I said, each work environment needs to tailor to their own requirements and have processes that meet their unique needs and those of their constituents. So the, I hope this is helpful. And again, in the guidebook, there is a lot more detailed information. So refer to that. And I'll ask Linda now to introduce our next speaker. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, and uh... Again, a lot of information to cover, hopefully a lot of good ideas to uh, so some food for thought, some some things to pull from. And again, our thanks to our neighbors at the Progressive Center for Independent Living for graciously sharing their uh, ideas and workspace with us. I am now thrilled to introduce uh, Maxine Neuhauser, who is a member of the firm in the Employment, Labor, and Workforce Management and Healthcare and Life Sciences Practices of Epstein Becker Green. Um, she is uh, a phenomenal employment lawyer. She, you heard her speak at our conference, at our webinars. Um, if you're in Union County, she is a pillar up there on many nonprofit boards there and whatnot. Um, so we. Uh, Work, the workplace issues and the employment law issues are an absolute minefield and so many questions. So we are beyond thrilled to uh, have Mickey come to speak with us today about some of those considerations. So Mickey, thank you. Let me just transfer control to you and we will be good to go. Okay, hello everybody. Okay, so every, can everybody see my PowerPoint? I yeah. can. Okay, good. So welcome, thank you. I'm going to be um, going through my program pretty quickly. 
Um, some of it is going to uh, cover um, what has already been said. I'm going to go through that part pretty quickly. Um, okay, so we are going back to work um, in preparation um, as uh, both Linda and Debbie mentioned is going to be critical. Um, and I'm, I don't know that this is going to be the new wardrobe, but there we go. So here are some of the key considerations that you're going to need to consider. Uh, safe workplace, reasonable accommodation, wage and hour, non-discrimination and non-retaliation, and leave and benefits laws. And these are the areas I'm going to be touching upon. Um, I have a half hour, uh, so uh, touching upon, um, even though I don't think that's the proper word in this COVID-19 environment, um, that's how we're going to operate here on this webinar. Uh, Linda went over where we are now, and here is a quick summary of it. Uh, and it does include links to uh, Governor Murphy's initial order, declaring the state of emergency, his stay-at-home order, which has just been lifted, um, basically lifted, um, his announcement of his outline for reopening, his announcement of a three-stage process for lifting restrictions, and then um, an excellent website um, that the state has regarding mitigation requirements that varies according to business type, and the website for frequently asked questions. So those are resources for you to um, call upon when you have got questions. Uh, and here is the uh, road back the, um, that Linda mentioned. The title of the PowerPoint is a link to the, um, to the graphic that is on the website. So it'll be handy in the PowerPoint when you get it. And this three-stage process for reopening, also the, the title at the top is a link to that. So it'll be handy in the PowerPoint, although you also will have it from the uh, handouts for this uh, presentation that the center is providing. And um, this is uh, the key, uh, I think take away from the um, road back and three-tier process, uh, which are precautions that apply across all stages and pretty much across all businesses, which is, as Linda said, work that can be done from home should be done from home. Clinically high-risk individuals who can stay home should do so. I want to actually put this in more employment lawyer speak, and that is clinically high-risk individuals who are per, who want to stay home should be permitted to do so if feasible. All right. I want to be careful to caution you that you cannot, as an employer, dictate to someone that they must stay home because they are high risk or because they are over 65. That starts treading into disability discrimination and age discrimination issues. I'm going to talk about those later. So when you see these guidelines, keep in mind that they are guidelines and they have to be um, excuse me, they're often shorthand and need to be um, applied with due consideration. And here, of course, are the overarching uh, requirements uh, that business should follow with respect to their employees and clients and customers with whom they interact. The CDC has um, COVID reopening and opening guidance. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is important 
because of the overarching requirement that you have under the law as employers, which is the duty of maintaining a safe workspace. So these guidelines pertaining to hygiene practices, hand washing, and employees wearing face cloth coverings, while not part of any law or part of any regulation at the moment, if you don't do it, the question um, may be, have you protected your employees sufficiently such that you can say you have met your duty to provide a safe workplace. That's, you know, and that is from an employment law perspective, not just a public health perspective, why it's going to be important for you to follow these guidelines. So again, Debbie went through um, much of this guidance um, and it, it does require planning and communication um, and monitoring employee absences, considering flexible leave policies and practices, and do be ready to consult with local health authorities if there are cases um, in your facility or if there's an increase of cases in your local area. There have been some instances that um, I have been counseled on where workplaces became hot spots and they had to close down for a period of time. And the local health authorities were very helpful in helping to manage that process. So here is the general duties clause. Um, and this is something you absolutely need to keep in mind. Again, I have a link to it, but it boils down to Employers must provide employees with a safe workplace, and that includes establishing and updating operating procedures and communicating them to employees. And uh, again, I, I don't want to repeat what Debbie went over. Uh, I will point out that the guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19 um, that OSHA has developed um, I have a link to it, and it again is very much um, keyed to uh, preparing and planning and then implementing the controls in accordance with your plan. And we've got the office opening recommendations um, that again Debbie went through. I want to point out at the bottom of this slide that New York State has developed a template for um, a developing a reopening safety plan that in fact New York employers are required to complete. And for um, those of you who um, in listening to these presentations feel like your head is going to spin off your shoulders and you don't know where to start, I suggest looking at this New York State uh, template because it is a step-by-step -step, fill in the blanks process that you can follow. It's about four pages long. In considering who should return to the workplace and who should stay home. Uh, again, this was a little touched on um, by prior um, speakers, but start thinking about what job functions must be performed at the workplace. In doing that, look at what has um, been happening at your agency for the past two or three months. Which job functions have not been successfully performed during work from home? What job functions have been successfully accomplished via telework? Is partial work from home viable? Are there jobs that 
can or should be reconfigured. Take into consideration commuting concerns. How are people going to get to work? Will they be able to get to work safely? And I do think you can take employee preference into consideration. Are there employees who would prefer to come to the office? Um, you know, I know that with many New York employers, they have employees who find it very difficult to work um, out of those tiny shared apartments and people want to come back to the office. Whereas there are other employees who um, need public transportation and if they can work from home, they want to. So take that into consideration as you are thinking about the future. The EEOC has um, developed substantial technical assistance in the form of FAQs um, under the heading, what you should know about COVID-19, the ADA, the, Rehabil excuse me, the Rehabilitation Act, and other EEO laws. New Jersey so far has been um, actually kind of silent in terms of the division on civil rights with respect to COVID-19. And I don't mean that in a negative sense. I mean that in terms of you can in this, I believe, be guided by the EEOC. So far, we are not getting contrary direction or guidance from the um, DCR, and that's a good thing. Um, there are some cities um, and locations, jurisdictions, that have been issuing some guidance that is in conflict with guidance that's being proposed um, or uh, posted by the federal government, and that can really create compliance issues. So luckily in New Jersey, so far, we're not confronted with that. And the EEOC guidance is a good place um, to look where, um, when you have questions, and they are in the form of questions and answers. Um, here are just a couple of highlights um, from, from those FAQs, um, which is importantly, it acknowledges the EEOC that COVID-19 presents a direct threat to the health of others sufficient to justify testing. Uh, so many que so questions have been asked, can I temperature test? Uh, today I had a question, can I um, require employees to have nasal swabs? Can I require employees to have blood tests for antibody testing? Um, I would not encourage requiring a blood test or requiring a nasal swab test. Um, I don't think there's a particular issue if you offer it, provided that it is being done by um, an appropriate health professional. And there are uh, several organizations that have uh, been established that will send nurses or physicians to um, your facility to do that testing if necessary. Um, you can do temp testing. You can ask about symptoms. You may require protective gear. You can require infection control practices. You must um, provide reasonable accommodation. You must engage in the interactive process when, um, when that situation develops. It is, um, according to the EEOC FAQs, the employee's responsibility to ask for accommodation. But I caution you that it is also the position of the commission that employees do not have to use the magic word, reasonable accommodation or magic words. And in this area, I would say that employers should be cognizant and not ignore if they believe they have an employee who might need 
accommodation and to be uh, perhaps proactive in asking. And as I said earlier, employees may not be excluded from a workplace solely because of an underlying condition or because they are at high risk. Um, this was in the New York Times um, yesterday or the day before yesterday. Uh, those of you who may be wanting to do a screening questionnaire uh, before each day, before an employee reports to work, there is an app for that. Uh, and if you Google, you will find that there are vendors who are selling IT solutions to uh, screening uh, employees with respect to symptoms. And these are two questions that Costco employees are going to be asked to respond to um, every day via an app. And depending on how they respond, they get a green light report to work or they get a red light stay home. In responding to requests for accommodation, um, and I think this is going to be taking up a lot of human resources bandwidth in the months to come. There's going to be requests pertaining to an employee's health condition and including mental health condition. And the EEOC FAQs address that mental health can issues may be exacerbated by the pandemic. It is possible that some of you have already experienced that with some of your employees. I know that I have had a lot of questions and consults with my clients regarding employees who are dealing with anxiety and depression that is impacting their ability to work productively. Uh, but you're also going to be confronted with requests for accommodation because an individual has a vulnerable family member at home and is concerned about becoming a carrier of the virus when they return home. You're going to be confronted with um, employees who have children at home and who knows what's going to be happening with schools and school closures. Um, as I mentioned, there are transportation concerns. And many employers are already dealing with issues of employees who are simply fearful of returning to work because of a fear that they will contract the virus. And so far, the mere fear of contracting the virus is not um, sufficient to justify an employee's absence from work. But um, if an employee has a reasonable belief um, that they are at heightened risk, then that employee may um, potentially reasonably refuse to work. That then leads you to the accommodation question, which is can this employee's work be done? Um, via telecommuting or virtually, or are there things that the employee can do even if that was not their job before that you can discuss? In all of this, communication is going to be key. Um, with respect to the interactive process and when it is the employee's own disability that is generating the request for accommodation. The EEOC provides examples of questions that um, an employer may ask. And I have them here um, just to give you uh, an idea of things that you may be able to ask and give and you may have other that may lead to other questions that you have and may also be applicable to other situations. I want to point out that an accommodation, that a reasonable accommodation 
uh, is not necessarily the employee's preferred accommodation. So for example, an employee who is seated, seated in an open area might object to returning to work because of the open area. But if the accommodation is that um, the employer is installing plexiglass dividers between each of the desks um, or is staggering work times um, or is um, having alternate work days. Some people work Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Some people work Tuesday, Thursday. Um, those are accommodations that uh, you might want to offer if you think somebody needs to be at work and cannot do their job from home. Another interesting thing is that accommodations can be temporary. So you might have someone who needs to be home for a while or needs to work um, a certain shift for a while. And it's the fact that you are offering an accommodation on a temporary basis um, does not necessarily mean that you're going to have to offer that accommodation forever. Um, because when it comes down to it, you don't need to A, offer accommodations that an individual doesn't need anymore. And two, you don't need to offer an accommodation that has become an undue hardship. So what is an undue hardship? Um, and this is from the EEOC guidance. Um, and I put in the 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 number the letter here because I wanted to illustrate that the EEOC has divided its FAQs into various categories by letter and so there are return to work categories there's um, and this one you know goes to reasonable accommodation which is category D and an employer does not have to provide a particular reasonable accommodation if it poses an undue hardship, which means significant difficulty or expense. Um, in some instances, an accommodation that would not have previously posed an undue hardship may now pose an undue hardship. So again, you know, looking at your workplace and jobs is going to be of critical importance when you're addressing these issues. Um, I want to touch upon wage and hour issues briefly. Um, and again, I have given you the web um, link to the US Department of Labor's um, guidance, FAQs um, for wage and hour. And again, New Jersey uh, guidance, um, we haven't seen anything that would really contradict any of the guidance that has been proposed or offered up by the feds. But can, but these are two areas that I've gotten questions on, which is can an employee be required to perform work outside the employee's job description? And the answer is yes, you can. This is true um, whether or not, um, you know, the work um, is that you've asked is in, what the, the, the employee's job description is or what the employee believes their job requires. Um, employees who are employed at will can have their terms of, and conditions of employment altered. Always, of course, you need to keep in mind that these changes have to be for legitimate business reasons. It's helpful to communicate them. Um, if it's permanent, you want to be looking at your job descriptions to revise them. But the mere fact that an employee's job does not say includes work from home, of course, does not mean that you can't require an employee to work from home. And then another question that I've gotten from nonprofit clients, because, I mean, these are really tough times and the economics of being a nonprofit agency are, are just, I mean, they were tough before and they're gonna be harder now. 
and you know as fundraising concerns you know increasingly come to the fore you're going to be you feeling the budget crunch so often i get asked well hey i'm a nonprofit yes i have employees but why can't my employee volunteer to do some things since i am allowed to have volunteers and the short answer is employees may not volunteer to perform on an uncompensated basis the same or basically similar work that they perform as an employee. Some wage and hour issues you have to be um, attuned to are your non-exempt employees remain entitled to be paid for all the time that they work. And so now we've got a lot of people working from home, non-exempt employees, who were never permitted to work from home. They, you know, lots of employers never provided their non-exempts with email access outside the office, didn't give them computers, didn't give them printers and scanners. And now these folks have the capacity to work 24 hours a day um, or to say that they have. And so you need to manage that. Uh, some of my clients, and one in particular, issued a directive that no employee was permitted to work more than eight hours a day and 40 hours a week without permission, because they also did not want their exempt employees emailing people at all times of the day and they were also concerned, frankly, of just the expansions of the day um, with, um, you know, interrupting people's, um, you know, home life and schedules uh, such that it became necessary to impose these policies and restrictions. You need to make sure your time, your employee's time is being recorded accurately and um, if you are changing job responsibilities for individuals you need to consider whether those folks are still who were exempt are still exempt so for example if you have an individual who when when your employees were at the work site supervised um, two through four employees and therefore was an exempt supervisor. But now working from home does no longer has those supervisory responsibilities, then you have to consider whether that person is still properly um, classified as an exempt employee. Similarly, if you have an employee whose job duties have been reduced to part time or in the coming months, you're going to be converting full time employees to part time employees. You have to keep in mind that an, ex an employee doing exempt work, work that would otherwise qualify them to be exempt, uh, may not be exempt if their annual pay goes below the salary threshold, which is about $35,000 a year. And then another question that's been asked of is when you start doing these temperature checks and self-assessment um, pre-screenings, is that time compensable? And the firm answer here is maybe. Um, in some states, definitely, um, it is, with California in particular, um, pretty definitely, I should say. Um, it is something that is getting a lot of attention, and there just has not been definitive guidance on it. Uh, New Jersey leave and benefits law. I don't have the time to go through all of these. I'm going to touch upon each of them. Um, New Jersey has a panoply of job protective leave and benefits laws. It's earned sick leave, family leave, 
temporary disability leave family leave insurance. We now have a COVID-19 anti-retaliation law. And keep in mind, we have always had the NJLAD, which considers leave as a potential reasonable accommodation. Under the New Jersey Earned Sick Leave Law, there were new regulations that were proposed, that were adopted this year. And I wanna point out key takeaways from those regs which is that if you have an umbrella PTO policy that covers your um, earned sick leave law um, obligations, all PTO must meet the earned sick leave laws or be uh, consistent and comply with the earned sick leave law requirements with respect to documentation, permitted use, deadlines for calling out, um, scheduling, payout, carryover, and the like. So not just the 40 hours earned sick leave, but it's all PTO if you have a single umbrella policy. So what the regulations and the law say is that all requests by employees to use earned sick leave are considered presumptively valid and you may not require a note for an absence of under three days. Um, you can require return to work notes. And um, importantly, you cannot require employees to use their accrued earned sick leave if they're out, even for an earned sick leave purpose. The earned sick leave law was expanded to permit employees to use their 40 hours um, mandated, or again, if you have a PTO policy that's an umbrella, it would apply to that. Um, because the child's school is closed during a declared state of emergency, because an employee's uh, quarantined, or to care for a family member. Um, and although these are COVID related, um, amendments. They are permanent amendments and apply to communicable disease epidemics and other public health emergencies that may arise even after the current crisis. Similarly, the New Jersey Family Leave Act was expanded to add reasons for um, health care, excuse me, reasons for taking leave which is because a child's school or daycare is closed or to care for a family member, leave can be taken continuously or intermittently at the employee's discretion. And interestingly, the intermittent leave applies even where there's been um, a declared state of emergency. Um, for myself, I find that a little odd that if somebody needs to take time off to care for someone who is quarantined, that the law requires that you permit them in the workplace, but that is what the law says. I suggest that you might want, if, that, if somebody is uh, wanting to return to work intermittently, that you try and come up with a work from home option because for myself, I think that is more consistent with public health, um, smart public health. Uh, and the reasons to take family leave that include because a child's school or daycare is closed. Um, uh, as of June 15, daycare centers are gonna be permitted to be reopened beyond just the emergency ones that have been opened. Uh, it remains to be seen to what extent that permittive reopening is going to impact um, whether um, an employee can take time off to care for a child due to daycare or um, school closures if the employee had other options for daycare or school. And the temporary disabilities um, benefits law has similarly been um, amended to cover disability because of COVID or, or communicable 
disease caused by an epidemic. Uh, and in such situations, um, the individual no longer has the one week waiting period to receive benefits. And here's um, an, kind of an important one, a COVID-related anti-retaliation law. Again, um, it is a law that is going to stay on the books um, even after the COVID crisis passes. Um, here's hoping that it passes. Um, and the reason that I think it's important is that it prohibits taking an adverse employment action against employees who take, request um, uh, time off due to an infectious disease that could affect others at work when they have taken that time off or requested that time off based on a recommendation of a New Jersey licensed medical professional. So consider the situation of an employee who has been quarantined for 14 days. So employment law, um, uh, you know, the, excuse me, the earned sick leave law provides 40 hours or five days leave. And an employee may not have been with you long enough to qualify for New Jersey family leave. But if you have someone who has who who meets this obligation or meets this criteria, you might have to give them that 14 days unpaid leave. And you're gonna to have to reinstate them. And you're not gonna be able to treat it as an excessive absence. So, you know, if this is gonna have, I think, some impact on employer attendance policies and, and how you deal with attendance issues. And New Jersey has on a web, its website, the New Jersey DOL, um, a chart showing various scenarios um, pertaining to um, when an employee is not at work and when benefits may become available and making it bigger here. Um, it is guidance and it says, you know, if an employer is out for this reason, X, do they get federal um, leave? Do they get federal sick leave? Do they get earned sick leave? Do they qualify for unemployment? It's a guide, um, and it, but it, it's a handy reference. And again, um, I give you the, the link for it. Um, I think I'm a little running short on time, so I am just going to very quickly fly through the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, FICRA. It is a, became effective April 1. It sunsets on December 30th, and it provides paid sick leave benefits and paid family leave benefits for COVID-related purposes. Um, and these are the reasons that an employee might be entitled to paid sick leave for absences related to COVID. They have to be unable to work or to telework um, because they have COVID related symptoms. They're caring for an individual who has COVID. They're caring for children whose schools are closed or they have similar, um, similar issues that they are dealing with. Um, and here's the amount of money that they get for their um, under the law. Uh, employers, as you know, um, who pro who pay this benefit, um, there is um, a, a tax credit, employee tax credit that you are essentially reimbursed from. And what's important is that this is a paid sick leave benefit that is available for immediate use for some of you who are hiring new employees um, and who will be hiring employees in the weeks and months to come, they're going to be entitled to this benefit from day one. Um, and there is a notice that you have to put in your workplace um, and, or e email it directly to employees, post it on your extranet or external website, and 
it is available at the website that I have um, shown here. And then there's also expanded family and medical leave um, benefits. That is a paid family leave benefit for um, COVID-related purposes. Important to remember that the that this law creates additional reasons to take FMLA. And the New Jersey expansion of the Family Leave Act provided additional reasons to take permitted leave, but the laws do not provide additional leave. So once an employee has used their 12 week leave allotment, they do not get to use another 12 weeks for one of these purposes. And um, under the expanded FMLA, the first 10 days is unpaid, but remember you have the emergency sick leave, which pays for the first 10 days. And then the remaining 10 weeks, there is a benefit of up to $200 a day. And for that benefit, an employee um, needs to have worked for you for 30 days. And here are um, links uh, for you if you have questions, FAQs about FICRA, FAQs about the FICRA notice, and additional um, guidance from the DOL. And there are um, here some bases for liability that you, you know, need to be concerned about as you are dealing with these employment issues. Um, and I have it here, not because I really want your head to spin off your shoulders, but because I want to bring home how important it is to plan and act with consideration to treat cases on a case-by-case -case basis or requests on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and to avoid, you know, running afoul of one of these laws. Um, and, and, and here's the final word um, that I want to leave with you. And those of you who have heard me present before have heard this before, but I always think it bears repeating. Um, you know, I don't expect that you're going to memorize that list of laws. Um, and it's impossible to know the ins and outs of each of them um, and their regulations and how they've been interpreted and the like. So what you want to do is you want to, in dealing with your employees, um, remember that you always should have a legitimate business reason for every employment-related decision you make. You always want to tell the truth. You want to communicate with your employees. You always want to be truthful with them. Um, you don't have to go on ad nauseum, but you know, classic example, you don't want to say a job has been eliminated if next week you're going to be posting for that position. You want to document, you want to show that um, you know you have communicated why you have done what you have done. And always treat your employees fairly and when, with respect, because when problems occur, it's so often it's because an employee is angry, because an employee feels they've been dealt with unfairly, they haven't been listened to. And to the extent that you as an employer can leave an employee feeling that they have been treated fairly, they have been treated with respect, they have been listened to, um, you're going to be um, you know, fairly well protected um, against um, a lawsuit, an employee trying to hang a legal reason or violation for a decision or an adverse decision that was made about them. And that's it. Thank you. Nikki, thank you so much. Um, it's so much to uh, 
to go through. Um, there's a reason why employment lawyers are so busy now and a reason why good employment lawyers are so valuable. Um, we have, um, I don't know if we have the, uh, um, somehow I made my slides live, so bear with me for a moment. Um, Caitlin has been monitoring the Q&A and uh, Caitlin, are there a couple of questions that, that we have time for just a couple? We're running uh, a little tight on time. I will give people a heads up that we'll probably run over the allotted 90 minutes, but again, everything is being recorded. If we can't get to a, a question that uh, you may have typed in the chat box, we will uh, certainly get to them uh, afterward. No, I actually think that uh, Debbie's gotten to most of those comments, uh, okay. those questions, and we've got some nice comments and, and contributions as well, which we appreciate, but I, I think we're good to go. Okay, um, bear with me for a moment because I wanted, Susan, is your uh, presenter screen live or no? I believe it is. I believe everyone sees my intro slide with my picture. Okay. Um, I need so go go right ahead. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Maxine and Debbie and Linda, and thank you all uh, for joining us today and for all you're doing for your communities. Um, I'm Susan Merrill O'Connor. I'm the communications director here at the Center for Nonprofits, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about checking in with your staff and morale and some other issues as far as communications. So checking in with your staff and stakeholders. Uh, we're pleased to say that, that many of you have already been doing this throughout the, the last few months. And it's also heartwarming that many of you have been checking in on us too, which we really appreciate. And we, we want our members to be communicating with us and, and let us know how you're doing. Um, anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues. As we know, the quarantine experience has been very concerning for many of us. And there's a lot of anxiety and fear about coming back to the workplace. And it should go without saying Saying, but organizations should not be dismissive or judgmental about this anxiety. As Maxine had mentioned, we also must realize that in addition to work stress, there's a lot of home stress we're all dealing with and still a lot of uncertainty. So give staff some avenues to express concerns either with coworkers, leadership, um, and if your employee benefits has an employee assistance program, an EAP, that's another wonderful outlet. Connect employees to resources at work and community resources as needed. And of course, always respecting privacy. You know, some employees will come to you and that they, they'll they'll be upfront that they need help. Um, but of course, you know, it's not something that needs to be shared throughout your organization. Um, everybody's going through this in a different in a different way. Employees may need additional social, behavioral, and other services to cope with their work in the field. And um, especially with the sickness and death of a loved one, you know, the, the coronavirus now in our state, there's over 165,000 cases, and I believe the last estimate was 12,000 deaths in our state alone. So chances are you know somebody. If it's not you, um, you know somebody, if maybe it's not somebody on your team, but somebody that you work with that is dealing with coronavirus head on. Um, management co-workers should be ready to work with staff members and volunteers in an empathetic and trauma-informed behavior, and there are some resources on that. Um, and again, remember that it, that it affects people in different ways, and we should also be ready to refer employees to professional mental health services should the need arise. And it's more important to really realize that this is not business as usual. I think the last few months have certainly um, We've we've known that, and it's taught us a lot of lessons. And we need to be perceptive and attuned to our staff, volunteer, and clientele. And as nonprofits, this is something I believe we do well. So um, you know, the compassion has been incredible, and and we need to continue doing that. Uh, in April, we had a wonderful webinar, Stress Management and Self-Care for You and Your Team During COVID-19 Crisis. And we had two presenters, Yvette Murray of YRM Consulting and Shauna Moses of Nanjama, New, Gentil, um, New Jersey Association of Mental Health and Addiction Agencies. And this is, uh, webinar is free on our website. As I mentioned, it was uh, done in late April, but it's still very re relevant. So you can go ahead and access that 
on the center's events page and the record webinars and we will be sending you a link to this as well as other resources and on that webinar Yvette and Shauna shared with us um, some resources and and you know some some support centers and things like that so we will definitely get that to you and as far as morale it's our hope that your staff is enthusiastic to get back to work but again it won't be business as usual so expect some changes in morale especially with policy changes and perhaps even staff changes that that they might not be coming back to the same um the same office that they left in March. And morale and mission are not mutually exclusive. In fact, in the most successful workplaces and organizations, they often go hand in hand. And in many cases, the mission of your nonprofit has never been more important than today. Um, you know, we have a lot going on, as I'm sure you all know. And this may recharge the passion of your staff and your volunteers. So checking in with your staff and stakeholders, again, continuing, encourage that positivity and show genuine care, um, you know, embrace the diversity of perspectives. Experiences are different for everybody and everybody's handling this differently. Perhaps you're already doing this, but establish regular communications and check-ins in groups and with employees individually. Include time to talk about something not related to work or the pandemic, whether it's a book you're reading or your pets. I mean, we've all been seeing everybody's pets a lot on the those Zoom calls and you know maybe the hot topic this week is what's the restaurant you're going to dine at when they all open up next week hope hope the weather's good for dining outside so um, you know hopefully your favorite restaurant is opening up next week and that could be the, the topic to get us off of uh, the more serious conversations and checking in with your staff and stakeholders again recal recalibrate expectations um, balancing flexibility, again, check in with individual employees more frequently, and again, provide resources, referrals for staff who are experiencing distress or need assistance, and provide staff with the chance to decompress. This can include formal check-ins, flexible scheduling. I know we've already mentioned staggering st schedules, so flexibility has never been more important, and it's really amazing to see how nonprofits are, are are still serving their communities, maybe even serving their communities more during during this pandemic. And it's it's the flexible leadership, I'm sure, that has a lot to do with this. And the staff's, again, commitment. So celebrate achievements and milestones. Um, you know, birthdays, work anniversaries, and other accomplishments are important to, to commemorate and celebrate. Uh, you can't do this in person, and maybe if we get back into person, we, we can't really do it as much, but we know of organizations that are doing this, that's maybe perhaps um, board and employee awards they're doing virtually where the CEO will hold up the award and then mail the awards to the individuals. Um, last week we sang happy birthday to our own Debbie uh, in a morning check-in call that we do every morning. We do a Zoom call. You know, it wasn't the cake and the coffee, but again, those in-person events might not be happening at, at, until a few months from now and you know if it wasn't for the pandemic next month we would have here at the center one of our own traditions which has been our open house wine and cheese social so while we can't have that this summer we hope to have it eventually um, but just so you know I'm toasting all of you now virtually and we really appreciate all the work that you're doing uh, so here's some of the resources I mentioned before from Yvette and Shauna, the self-care resources and also supporting organizations. And you will receive this in um, the PDF of the slides. So communications and public relations. Communication has never been more important and transparency is also essential. Whether you're talking to your, your staff, your board, your volunteers, your clientele, your donors, um, it's really an optimal time that we engage more with our closest allies. So board communication, as you begin to re-engage, inform your board, which I'm sure many of you are already doing, and I, I re really, we really appreciate the board members on this webinar as well. Share with them this webinar when you get the link and also our guide that's available online. And work with your board chair. Get some advice from board members who are reopening their own workplaces. See the, see the ways that they're doing it and really listen to their advice. And have regular updated and uh, meetings with your board. And remember that you still have your mission and programs. And even if you're not 
if everything's not so um, COVID-19 focused, which we hope you're also doing a lot of the other work for your communities, you know, let your board know that. Keep them abreast of everything that you're doing. And talking about donor relations, have frank discussions with your donors and funders. Remember, your supporters are already invested in your organization, and they want to see you succeed. So be clear on how this crisis is affecting you, your programs. Um, you know, be direct on how they can help. If you're having trouble meeting restricted grants or contract obligations, talk to them. Many of them are being very flexible right now, and we certainly appreciate that. Um, as for canceled events, some funders and sponsors are allowing you to keep that sponsorship as a donation. And my colleague Caitlin will be talking a little bit more about events next. But um, you know, it's really being upfront with your funders, and many of them have increased their funding and um, have even started relief funds. So check out our website on our COVID relief um, COVID nineteen page. We do have some of those relief funds. Communication, communicating to the public. Um, I'm sure you're getting your message out there now that you that you're reopening or you're you're ramping up um, some of your programs. You know, um, you could do this in a press release, an email, a simple statement on social media, a message on your website. Be transparent and let them know what guided you in this decision making. And here's a sample of something that we've been had, having in our eblast since March. Just a message to remind you that we are we are operating remotely and we are working harder for you more than ever. Um, here are the ways to get in touch with us. So we've been having this little boilerplate on all of our e-blasts so that people know that we are here for you. And again, if you're a very public-facing organization, um, make sure that uh, you have established a single point person. That's always a good idea even if it's not a crisis, to have a single point person to get the message out about what you're doing and how you're keeping the public safe. And communicating to your staff. Well, this probably should be the first group to communicate with. Um, we can't stress enough that communication to staff and board and volunteers and donors should be especially transparent and with great detail as necessary. Being forthcoming with updates will help prevent the spread of inaccurate information or rumors. Um, you know, let, let your staff know that you, of course, are listening to their concerns as well. And ongoing communications. We know it's going to be months and months that we're going to be working in, in this new normal. So you may want to devise a plan of ongoing communications for the next several months that focus on the internal work and your external work and keeping everybody up to date on your hours of operation. Um, you know, your, your website should be updated often and what your protocols are for visitors. So, um, you know, that is just some of the things that, a lot of this is common sense, we know, for nonprofits that have already been really communicating with their communities, and we really appreciate the work that you're doing. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Caitlin Giles McCormick. She is our program coordinator here at the Center for Nonprofits, and Caitlin is going to be talking a little bit about events. So without further ado, Caitlin. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, really appreciate um, everything and, and the information and we'll talk about um, events real quick and as the slide says the um, events have changed um, and, and there's that's quite the understatement honestly <laughs> um, as we've already experienced um, everyone's events are changing information fairs network gatherings trainings performances awareness ceremonies galas and other fundraising events have all significantly changed already um, as excited as we are um, for the state to reopen um, and things are changing really fast and organizations must adapt um, and make a lot of contingencies for their events even as they start to resume in some capacity. Local and state guidance is consistently changing um, and will likely continue to fluctuate so um, those contingencies are, are key. <clears throat> the number of people likely to be permitted in a, um, in a space is quickly rising um, but I, we do not anticipate for that um, you be, to be able to get to 100% anytime soon. Um, additionally, you may have um, people who usually come to your events who have those first and secondhand experiences with COVID-19, um, and there will be a wide variety of comfort level to a, coming to an in-person event. Um, and so something like that is essential to be thinking about when if you're considering having an in-person um, event at this point in time. Something that 
is to, con to be considered whether you keep events in person or go virtually is donors and sponsors. Um, a lot of times, if you look back at your previous donor requests or, or sponsor requests, you may have some really good information to draw on and less may need to be changed than you anticipate. Um, so that's, that's, I think, an encouraging message. Um, telling the story, though, about where things have changed and why they've changed and how you're changing your um, approach in addressing the COVID crisis while still continuing to um, serve your population. Those are things that your donors want to know about. And that continued communication, as Susan was referring to, um, is essential and will help with those fundraising and planning of events. Videos and photos are particularly powerful, um, as well as direct mail. People are getting a lot less direct mail. So that is, if you're doing a stay at home event, a direct mail appeal can be a really good and effective way to get that message across and have people take time um, and think about your organization, even if it's not that physical event. The other piece that is really important to consider when you're um, supplementing or changing an event is that if you don't ask for money, you, you won't receive it. <laughs> um, we have a lot of dedicated uh, donors and, and sponsors that have been with us a lot of times. Um, however, if they don't hear from you, if they don't get the ask, um, they are very, very, very unlikely to um, to give. And so thinking about if you are having an event, is a 50% income return um, enough? Is a 25% income return enough to what you usually have and what you usually budget for? And is that a good use of your time and expenditure? Um, and it can frequently get you closer to your budget goals, um, even with that considerable um, less amount of income that may be received or that you may anticipate. And you may also be very, very surprised about people's interest um, in participating. Can we go to the next slide, Susan? Oh, uh, before, we, we, before we advance, I do want to take a quick note. Um, and there are two great webinars that talk about um, replicating events and changing specifically around fundraising. Um, and those are from the United Way of Greater Mercer County and the nonprofit Times, because I could, we could spend another hour, hour and a half just on events alone. So um, if you're looking for that level of detail, these are two great webinars to check out. All right, and if we go into the next slide, Lisa, thank you very much. So if you are able um, to move over to a virtual event, there are certainly some pros and cons to consider in advance. Um, local and state guidance is essential. So staying up to date on that is um, is the first thing to consider. There's a lot of um, platforms out there, um, and a lot of people are now used to this platform, used to working um, virtually and having these types of conversations. But you can there is almost anything that you want to do, you can figure out how to do it. And so finding the right platform um, is one of the key considerations. And we do have a link and you will get it um, to a nice tech impact piece um, that talks about some of the specific different platforms that are out there. Zoom is incredibly popular right now. It is typically relatively affordable, but it does have certain upgrade features and things like that. Um, the the fact that it's permeated and so many people have used it is certainly a benefit, but um, GoToWebinar, BlueJeans, a few other programs out there um, are also are very helpful and very um, user friendly as well. The other thing to remember with a virtual event is that there is a digital divide still. People do not have the same level of access. Um, while a virtual event is something that allows you to um, reach more people geographically, thinking about access issues, language barriers, um, hearing impairments, things like that are all things to be considered when going virtual and especially considering who your attendees typically are. Um, some events, depending on the event, may take a considerable amount of con um, creativity and reimagining. So something always to keep in mind. Um, the, Planning a virtual event in lieu of an in, um, in-person event is also not going to necessarily be less work. Um, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of coordination between presenters, 
um, and different segments of your event, depending on how complicated you're getting. If people are used to presenting, if you're bringing presenters in from outside, practice and training and repetition is essential. And that takes a considerable amount of, of, of time and adjustment ahead of time. Finally, we also have fatigue. People are tired of being on Zoom and tired of being in these different environments. Um, and so it's always something to keep in mind in terms of the length of your event and the frequency and things like that. We're going to move on to the next slide real quick. Thank you. All right. Yes, in-person events, you, the key here is flexibility and making contingencies as much as possible. And I skipped to this a little bit in the last slide, talking about local or state um, restrictions are cons constantly updated at the government site, covid19.nj.gov. So that going to the source for the most up-to-date statewide restrictions is the best place to go. But your county may also have some guidelines and restrictions as well. So wherever you're holding the event, check out the county's website there to see if they have guidance. Examine your contracts to see if you have, um, when you, you are allowed to cancel, when are you are able to reschedule, um, if there are fees associated that by that. And Pro Bono Partnership has a really great step-by-step -step guide in terms of when you're looking at those contracts, the things that are um, considered. And there is that link there. Um, there are additional regulations for performing arts um, events. And so that there are links that are included in our going forward. Um, guide as well, which you which is available actually in the handout section of this webinar um, and also will be sent to you tomorrow and is available on our website. So let me go to the next slide real quick. We're, we're getting close to the end here. So in-person events as well, continuing. The center um, strongly encourages um, that you ask your, that you require that your attendees wear a mask and can adhere to social distancing um, and you should make these exceptions clear ahead of time again lots of communication with every constituency with every stakeholder that you have um, ask your attendees to bring their own personal protection equipment um, but this but always have extras on hand as well um, wipes sanitation stations um, mask as well it can be a branding opportunity depending on your type of event, um, which is an interesting idea. And it's my daughter's Taekwondo um, teacher actually sold, has sold a bunch and it's, we love it. We love having that on there. Um, and in, additional, uh, in addition, please provide visual markers wherever possible. Um, very similar to what Debbie shared in the pictures um, of the office across the hall from us um, as well. So you'll need that at your in-person events. Food and drink handling. Um, again, repeating a little bit from what Debbie touched on, having no self-service um, wherever and whoever's serving the, the food should have the proper pr protective equipment, um, masks and gloves, and proper changing of those and updating the, um, of those as you're going along. Small events um, should not have potluck style meals, um, no communal um, drinks or um, serving utensils and things like that. Everybody should be served in those situations. Unfortunately, um, environmentally, this means a lot more single service, single serve um, containers, especially with water. Um, it's not particularly environmentally friendly, but at this point in time, it is what we are recommending. So keep in, that, in mind that as well. Um, and I think that is it for events. Real quick, if there are other questions, we can certainly um, take those. I have not kept up on the questions. Um, there. Don't see anything. Go ahead, Linda. Okay. Um, thank you, Caitlin. Um, thank you, Susan. And thanks to all of you still on the line here. We packed an awful lot of information in this session. Um, I just have a few closing uh, thoughts very quickly before we wrap this up. Okay. Um, it's not me talking if I don't mention advocacy. And we're talking about tumultuous times that we're living in. 
uh, our social, our democratic norms, our principles of humanity, quite frankly, are being tested in new and, and uh, sometimes very frightening ways. And whether we are engaged in peaceful protest, advocating to the government on, on the town uh, and local level or in Trenton or Washington, or engaged in nonpartisan voter registration, we need to be out there. Raise your voice, get out, vote, help with voter engagement, speak up. Good policy and social reforms don't happen by accident. They happen when we speak out and we can't afford to sit on the sidelines. So please speak up and uh, you won't be speaking alone. Next. Um, remember, critically important, if you have not yet done it, fill out your census and tell everybody in your orbit to do the same. It is one of the single most important ways to ensure that New Jersey gets its fair share of resources and representation and that our communities are, are as taken care of as they can be. You know, this is only once every 10 years and there is a lot at stake. So there's a lot of great information from the Department of State, from uh, the Advocates for Children of New Jersey, which coordinates uh, uh, census uh, activity. Uh, so a lot of good information out there, but please, please fill it out, spread the word, especially in hard to count communities. There is an awful lot at stake. Next. Uh, just as a reminder, we are on social media channels. Please stay in touch with us. Sometimes we get information on uh, social media before we can get to it in the e in the email or even on our website. But there are lots of different ways to stay connected with what we're doing and to keep in touch so that we know what you need. So please uh, bear in mind uh, that these are some of the resources. Visit our COVID-19 page. Again, that is updated regularly. Next. And where you've come to to the end, I again want to thank uh, I, I want to thank everybody uh, for being part of this session. I want to thank Debbie Duncan, Susan O'Connor, Caitlin Giles McCormick of our amazing staff team for putting the guide and this webinar together. Um, our deep thanks to Mickey Newhauser for sharing her expertise with us. Um, a lot of great information, and again, you will receive the slides, the recording, and a boatload of links to other uh, important resources uh, within the next day or so after today's webinar. So finally, thank you all for everything that you are doing to make our communities better, to keep our communities safe, and thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to staying in touch. Thank you.